In this episode, I'll explain how to use an electronic test meter, a multimeter, a VOM, a volt ohm meter, like this Fluke auto ranging digital meter, or this not so auto ranging digital meter. And I'll also show you how to use a analog meter like this one. So if you encounter a meter like one of these, you'll be able to use it with confidence. Now I think a meter is a tremendously useful tool. And if you do any kind of repair around the house or electronic repair or electrical work, or you work on automobiles, having a meter is a vital tool and you should have one. If you don't have one, I'll provide some links down below for products that you can pursue. I'll give you a couple of my opinions on what to purchase. I would purchase a Fluke digital meter. When you look at professionals who use meters, chances are they're probably carrying a Fluke because you can rely upon a Fluke meter to be accurate and dependable. Now, there's a lot of meters in the market and you can pick one up at your local home improvement store and it would probably be just fine. But I know that I can rely upon my Fluke meter and a Fluke meter isn't really all that expensive. And as a typical home handy person doing casual repairs of electronic equipment, you don't need some kind of laboratory reference model meter that's going to be super costly. I'll give you a quick story on this topic, which is I was out camping a few years ago and I had an electrical problem at the back of the camper. I had this piece of garbage. Uh, no, it's not that bad. It's a, it's a good meter. I had this piece of garbage in my camper in the small toolkit that I carried with me. And I went back there to measure what was going on and it told me that I was only getting about 9 volts. And I should have been getting about 12. And so I thought, well, that's a clue. That explains why things are working kind of strange. So I must have a bad connection somewhere in the camper, I figured. I thought, well, I'll just go up to the battery, which should be 12, 12 and a half volts, and follow that line to the back of the camper. And where I see the voltage drop, well, somewhere in that vicinity, there's probably going to be a bad connection. So I go up to check the battery, and the battery was only reading about 9 volts. I thought, ooh, that's not good, but the battery charging system is saying it's being charged, but I'm only getting 9 volts. I've got a problem with the electrical charging system in the camper, and no wonder I've got electrical problems if there's not enough voltage here. And that was a bigger problem than I was prepared to deal with out in the, the woods. But I was heading home that day later anyway, so I thought I'll just suck it up and I'll take care of this issue when I get back home. So I get back home and I put the fluke meter onto the battery and this is reading 12 and a half volts, just like it's supposed to. And that made me think, well, gee, maybe things charged up on the drive home. What's going on? So I put this meter back on and it's only reading nine. This meter, with its inaccurate reading, led me astray. And so you need to be able to trust your test equipment. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad meter. The problem was that the meter has a battery in it that had just died. And the dead battery caused this to misread and caused me to misdiagnose the problem. I think with the fluke meter, if there was a bad battery, it would have told me there was a bad battery or it wouldn't have worked, and I wouldn't have been led astray in my diagnosis. So, I'm a fan of fluke meters. I consider them to be the king of digital meters. And this fluke meter is probably going to outlive me, so I see it as more of an investment than an expense. And they're really not that expensive for a basic general purpose fluke meter. So that's what I'd recommend that you get. Now, as for an analog meter, you don't see too many of these anymore. They used to be super popular, super common. Everybody seemed to have one, but most people are now using digital meters. But there's still a place 
for an analog meter like this, and I think this is still a useful tool. And the major companies that I trust to make good, high-quality analog meters are Triplet, which this one is. This is a Triplet Model 60, and Simpson. The Simpson 260 is legendary. They've been around since, I think, the 1930s, and they're still in production today. Now, these meters have never been inexpensive. They're precision pieces of equipment. Well, but I was actually a little surprised at how expensive they are today. Purchasing a new meter like one of these will set you back between $400 to $600. Now, the good news is that you can still find them pretty inexpensively. Because they were so popular and they've kind of been cycled out a little bit, you see a lot of these meters in estate sales and sometimes garage sales and on eBay. I recently picked this meter up on eBay for $25 plus shipping, and it's in great shape. Now, of course, your mileage may vary. If you're shopping in the used market, you have to be careful to purchase something that's been gently used. Now, an issue that you might encounter if you purchase an old meter like this is that if the meter is 20 or 30 years old, it may have drifted out of calibration and it may not be reading perfectly accurately anymore. However, meters like this triplet and the Simpson meters are really high quality pieces of equipment and they do tend to hold their calibration for a very long time. This one, even though it was made back in the 80s, it still seems perfectly accurate. So, if you don't have a meter, I think you should get one. And if you're not familiar with using a meter, well, I think you should continue watching the video and I'll show you how to do basic measurements and troubleshooting with a meter, be it a digital meter or an analog meter. So, let's get started. All of these meters operate pretty similarly. Each of them have a big multi-position switch, which turns the meter on. Right now it's in the off position. If I put it to one of these two positions, it would be used for measuring AC or DC voltage. In the next two positions, this is used for doing continuity checks, where when you measure a connection that has continuity, or you touch the probes together, the meter will beep. And that's sort of handy since you don't have to actually keep your eye on the display. You can just probe around and check for continuity by listening to the beeps from the meter. The next one shows an ohm symbol, which measures resistance. So you can see what the resistance of something is, whether or not it's an open circuit or there's continuity. Or you could measure something like a element inside of your water heater to see if it's still good. Or you could measure a loudspeaker's voice coil to see if it's still intact. The next two positions in this meter are for checking certain types of electronic components. Uh, this one is used for checking semiconductors such as diodes, and this measures capacitors. Those are sort of additional features you find on this model meter. These last two positions are used for measuring either DC or AC current in amperes. And you have to be careful with a meter when measuring current because the meter appears to be a short circuit and it passes the current through the meter as it measures it. And this meter has a limitation of 10 amps of current. And so you don't want to put it into a situation where you're going to drive more than 10 amps of current through this meter. You could damage the meter or pop a fuse inside of it. These buttons up here at the top are features that are specific to this model meter. And they do things such as a hold button which locks whatever reading it picks up onto the display minimum and maximum so if there's some signal that's fluctuating around you can lock in the minimum and maximum values that it records there is a range button here which locks the meter into a specific measurement range this is kind of like the automatic transmission in your car when you can drop it into second gear and force it to stay there regardless if it wants to shift or not because this is an auto ranging meter it automatically determines the scale to do its measurement at and the last button is labeled Hertz, which allows you to check frequencies of AC signals. So if you were to plug this into the line voltage and push the Hertz button, 
it would show that the line is at 60 cycles per second. That's what the power company delivers. So those are the features of this digital meter. This is an auto-ranging digital meter. You don't have to choose the range, you just have to choose the mode. Either volts, or resistance, or current. Let's take a look at another meter. This meter is very much like the previous one that we just looked at. There's a multi-position switch for selecting what it is we're interested in measuring. All the way down turns the meter off. The first group here is for measuring current, and this meter is very limited for the amount of current that it can pass through and accurately measure and safely measure. The next group is DC voltage, AC voltage, and resistance or continuity. But you'll see that within each of these groups there are multiple settings for different ranges. And so we need to know approximately the magnitude of the signal that we're going to be measuring so we can put the meter into an appropriate range where it can accurately report that. For example, if we look at the DC voltage group, you'll see that there's settings for like 500 volts at the top, which is the maximum that we can read. But if we're going to read a car battery, for example, that's not a very good scale to be on. So I would set it down a couple notches to 20 volts maximum. And that would be a much better place to read a 12 volt battery. We have to be on a scale that is higher than the signal level that we're going to read. But we want to be in the scale that is most appropriate to what we're going to be looking at. So a 12 volt bat car battery would probably be best looked at on a 20 volt maximum scale. Here we have the triplet model 60 analog meter and just like the prior meter that we saw we have a multi-position selector switch in this case off is at the very top and we can measure DC voltages or AC voltages or resistance or current. On this meter the current goes up to a thousand milliamps that's otherwise known as one amp so we can only measure up to one amp of current through this meter safely. If we exceed that, we could damage the meter or blow an internal fuse. And like the other meter, we need to set the range that we're going to be measuring. So for example, if I'm on AC over here and I want to measure the line voltage coming out of the uh, power in the wall, I'm expecting our line voltage to be 120 volts. And so I have scales for 1,000, 300, and 100, and on down. Well, if I try to measure 120 volts on the 100 scale, that's going to be beyond full deflection of the meter, and I won't be able to read anything, so that's no good. If I try to read it at 1,000, the meter's going to be way down here, and going to be difficult to get an accurate reading. So I'm going to choose 300, which would be 300 volts full scale. And so 120 will put me around here, and that'll be a nice place to read that voltage. Now these different scales relate to different scales that we read on the face of the meter. And Primarily, there are three things we're going to look at on this meter. If you're in resistance mode, that's the very top red scale. Those numbers across the very top. And then you see the rest of these ranges are either 1 or 3, or 10 or 30, or 100 or 300. It's either a 1 or a 3. And the black band right here is calibrated so that it ends in 3 or it ends in 10. And so depending upon which scale we're on, if it's a scale that ends in 3, like 300 volts, well, we use the one that ends in 3 up here and read that part of the meter. If we're on a 1,000 volt scale, well, the 10 would equal 1,000, and the 9 would equal 900, and 8 would be 800, and so forth and so on. And so that's how this meter is operated. Now there's one exception, which is one of the AC volt ranges, the three volt range has its own scale down below. But all of the rest of it is handled on this one line right here, this dual black scale that ends in either three or 10 
or for resistance, we use the very top line in red, right across the top, that has zero on this side on the far right and infinity on this side on the far left. And so that's the basics of operating all of these meters. So let's try checking a battery to see if the battery is in good shape. So here I have a simple AA battery, which should be about 1.5 volts if it's alkaline and a little bit less than that if it's a rechargeable, which this is. So I'm expecting it to be around eh, 1.3 volts or so. And it's DC since it's a battery. And so I put the meter onto a DC scale at three volts maximum deflection. So that means that 1.5 volts should be straight up and down in the meter and you'll see that there's a indication for 15 right here which would be 1.5 volts on a 3 volt scale max deflection. So we'll just put my negative terminal, the black terminal, against the negative side of the battery, the red one against the positive side of the battery, and we'll watch the meter climb up to approximately 1.4 volts. And so that would tell me that this battery looks like it's in pretty good shape. Now, of course, testing a battery with a meter isn't entirely in inclusive. It tells you if you have enough voltage, but it doesn't tell you if the battery is able to actually do real work and deliver current. But if the battery has got really weak voltage, that's a sign that the battery is not in very good shape. So let's take a look at the same battery, but this time I'll use... A digital meter. As you can see I have set this meter to measure DC voltage because we're measuring a battery and batteries are DC and I'm going to take the black probe, the negative probe, and apply that to the negative side of the battery. I'll take the red probe, the positive, and I put him onto the positive terminal of the battery and the meter reads 1.4 volts, just like the analog meter did. Now you notice that this meter actually reads 1.414. So it's got great resolution and it can tell you exactly what the voltage is, whereas the analog meter is a little bit less precise. But they both do the same job. Now you'll notice that with the digital meter, if I was to put these probes on backwards and put the negative probe to the positive side of the battery and the positive to the negative, you'll see now the display on the meter reads a minus symbol in front of it, telling you that the probes are reversed, that the positive probe is actually going to a negative source. So you can tell which direction the energy is flowing by the negative sign or not in the display. If I was to do this with the analog meter, it would shove the needle down below the zero of the scale off to the left-hand side. Next, we're gonna take a look to see if this speaker is good. This is supposed to be a four ohm speaker. Now, when speakers are rated, that rating is the impedance or the resistance of that speaker to audio signals. The meter is going to test it with a DC signal, which may be a little different in resistance than the spec of the speaker. So even though the speaker is rated at 4 ohms, I wouldn't be surprised if I get a number that's a little bit different than that when measuring it with a DC meter. But the DC meter will tell me if the speaker is okay. If I read an open connection, very high numbers, very high impedance, that means the voice coil is burned out in the speaker. If it comes back as a dead short, which would be unusual, well, that wouldn't be good either. So I'm going to expect to see probably between 2 and maybe 8 ohms of DC resistance on the speaker, even though it's rated as a 4 ohm speaker. So to do that, I'm going to put the meter up into ohms mode to measure resistance. And I'm going to put the probes against the speaker terminals. And we see that it says that this speaker is 3.9 ohms, right about 4 ohms. So that's a pretty good sign. Now, a feature that this meter has and that many digital meters have is continuity check, 
which is really just a resistance check as well. It's the same as what we did last time, except that when it sees that there's a connection between points, it will beep. So it's beeping and telling me it sees a 4 ohm connection. And that's a good test of the meter too, is to put it into continuity check mode and make sure that the meter beeps so that you know that all your test leads and the meter and everything is working. Let's take a look at this speaker using the analog meter. With the analog meter, I have to determine approximately what resistance I'm expecting to measure to put it into the appropriate scale to measure that load. And down here are the resistance measurement functions. And on the very top line of this meter display is the resistance measurement. And so I'm going to put this down to times one, because this is a pretty low impedance. I'm looking for four ohms. And so this scale will read dead short connection all the way full scale at zero ohms, and the numbers go up as I move toward the left. And so I'm going to start out by just connecting these two probes together and shorting them out. And I should see the meter move up to the zero position at the very top of the scale here. At the very top, it should say zero, and the meter should be right about at that point. If it's not there, there's an adjustment right here that allows you to calibrate the meter for zero ohms. So you can adjust this until the meter reads zero, like so. And then I take the two probes and put them onto my speaker. Make sure I'm getting a good connection on it. And again, you'll see that It's reading right about 4 ohms on the meter. Now this meter applies a little bit more power to the circuit while it's doing the measurement. And so you can hear that it actually energizes the speaker a little bit when I put those probes on it and I'm putting a little bit of power through the speaker. And so that too is a pretty good sign that, yep, that speaker's working. One of the great things about digital meters is that they are very accurate. If I measure this battery, it will tell me that we are at 1.425 volts. Right on. Whereas if I was to use an analog meter, I'd look at that and go, eh, it's just a smidgen under 1.5 volts, about 1.4. And so digital meters show you exactly what the voltage is. Now in most applications, Knowing the voltage to the second or third decimal place, not really that important. But it's nice to have that kind of accuracy. Now the place where the digital meter falls short and the analog meter really shines is if you are dealing with measurement of a voltage that is changing. So if there's a bad connection that's cutting in and out, or if you're looking at an audio signal, or some kind of contact that is turning on and off. With the digital meter, it just updates every fraction of a second, and you'll see a sequence of changing numbers, which can be a little bit challenging to interpret. Whereas with the analog meter, you can see the meter movement swinging around, and it tells you exactly what is going on. Now, this meter has a little bar graph underneath the display that emulates an analog meter movement, so you can kind of see what's happening, but it's still not as good as a true analog meter. So let's take a look at an audio signal and see how it compares between measuring on this meter versus the analog meter. So I've hooked up this meter to an audio line and you can see the audio signal bouncing around on the meter. When I speak, it pops up and you can see that there is voltage on that line. And it's a little bit tough to interpret just looking at the numbers bouncing around because they seem kind of random every fraction of a second they update. 
On this meter, there is a bar graph display underneath those numbers, which does show you what's going on. So that's a helpful feature, but it's not quite as intuitive as looking at the signal on an analog meter. So let's put the triplet meter up here and you can see how this would be rendered on that meter. So I've set this meter to three volts AC mode so I can look at that audio line. And you can now see that it looks like a typical audio meter. When I speak into the microphone, it comes through on the signal line and you can measure exactly what's happening on that line and get a pretty good idea looking at the meter as to where those levels are at any point in time. It's not cutting up things into little fractions of a time segment. It's completely linear and you can tell exactly what's happening with the analog meter as the signal is changing on the line. So this is an application where having an analog meter can be really pretty helpful as a visual cue as to what's going on. So if you've got signals that are cutting in and out or changing value, you can see with an analog meter exactly in proportion what's going on at any moment in time. Let's talk about measuring current. This meter is able to measure up to one amp of current. Whereas this meter can measure up to 10 amps of current. And neither of these meters are designed to measure very large amounts of current. Now on the fluke meter, if you want to measure current, you need to move your meter probe connection from this one over to this one, which is the current setting. And you would then switch the meter over to current measurement mode. And in current measurement mode, the meter appears to be just a straight wire. So it can pass the power through the meter to whatever load you're measuring and tell you how much current is passing through the meter. So this appears like a dead short circuit in current measurement mode. And this is important to know because this is how a lot of people damage meters. So when you're measuring current, it's expected that you're going to break a connection in some circuit and insert the meter into that point so it can measure the current flowing through that point. If you were to put the meter into current measurement mode where the meter looks electrically like a short circuit, like a piece of wire, and then touch these probes onto a car battery, or really most any battery, or push them into a wall socket, well, what you're trying to do is to measure how much current that source can deliver. And I assure you that the power socket in the wall can deliver more than 10 amps into your meter, or it can deliver far more than one amp into that other meter. And the meter is not designed to handle that kind of current. And so you could damage the meter. Uh, best case scenario is you will blow a fuse inside of the meter. And so I see a lot of meters with blown fuses because somebody had put the thing into current measurement mode and then tried to measure the current of some kind of source that can deliver a lot of current, like pushing this into a wall socket or trying to measure a battery and seeing how much current the battery can put out. So these are only designed to measure small amounts of current in electrical circuits. Now, if you do need to measure a very large amount of current, there are accessories, accessory probes that you can use to measure those larger amounts of current. And they provide just a small sample that can be measured by the meter and interpreted correctly. So I hope that this was a quick overview of how to use a multimeter that was helpful to you. And if you don't have a meter, I think it would be a great idea to get one. And I've provided some links down below. So there's some products that you can take a look at. I appreciate you tuning in. I hope this was informative and helpful. And if you find that to be the case, I would wish that you'd subscribe to the channel because that'll help you find this content more easily next time. So thanks for tuning in and hanging out for a while. And I'll see you on another upcoming video.